Amen. All right, so look there in uh, Matthew chapter number 22 and verse number 37. The Bible reads, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So, if you, if you, basically, if you can get these two commandments right in your life, the Bible says that you've fulfilled all the law, which is to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. But then it says that the second commandment is, is like unto it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. So when Jesus is asked, what is the great commandment in the law? This is what his answer is, is that number one, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. And also the second is like unto it, to love thy neighbor as thyself. So we need to know, so the title of my sermon is How to Love Jesus. So we need to know how to love Jesus because loving God is the most precious thing that we need to remember as Christians and loving God is the reason why we're here. Uh, turn in, uh, to, in your Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter number 12 and verse number 13. Uh, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number 13. The Bible says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. I'll also read to you from John 14, 15. The Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So if someone is a Christian, they might think to themselves, well, of course I love Jesus. I'm in church today, right? I'm singing hymns, right? But loving Jesus is more than just going to church, right? So the world is filled today with... Christians that they think they know how to love Jesus and they don't really love Jesus or they don't really they they think they know how to love Jesus and they don't really know how to love Jesus and there are people today who don't love Jesus at all and they think they love Jesus so these statements they sound similar but they are really two different situations one group is they're saved but they have a misguided attempt at loving Jesus and the other group is unsaved but they're deceived by their own heart so we must were, we were remember that the Bible says in Matthew uh, 7.13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So there's many unsaved people who they, they think they love Jesus, but in reality they love another Jesus, right? They're, they're going down the broad path of destruction. They haven't really found the straight gate because they haven't actually been seeking the right way. They're just basically, you know, seeking their, their own lusts and pride. So they think they love Jesus, but then rather they love another Jesus. They're deceived by Satan into believing a lie through their own pride. So turn in the Bible to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. So we're, ta- we're talking about how to love Jesus. There's a lot of people that, that they, either they have a misguided attempt or, or they just, they don't love, they don't love, they think they love Jesus and they don't actually love Jesus, in which case is, is unsaved people. So 2 Corinthians chapter number four, I'm going to read to you from Matthew 7, 7. Matthew 7, 7 says, ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you for everyone that asketh receiveth and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. So the Bible says that if you're truly seeking Jesus, you're going to find Jesus, right? So how is it somebody that they end up loving another Jesus? It's because they're deceived. As broad as the way that, that leads to destruction. They're not actually seeking God with a, with a humble heart. They're, they're not really asking to find Jesus. They're just f- fulfilling their own lust. So in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, we're, we're going to... Uh, we're going to read from verse number three. It says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So they're choosing not to believe. When they're presented with the real Jesus, they're not believing in the real Jesus. They're trusting some other Jesus. There's, they're, they're trusting another Jesus, and they do so simply because they're not seeking Jesus. They're seeking a God that's going to fit into their own image, into their own likeness. They want a God that's going to make them feel good, right? So we have a world filled with so-called Christians, right? They're not really saved, 
but they love their own version of Jesus and not the Jesus of the Bible. They love a Jesus that's okay with adultery, even though Jesus in the Bible says that adultery is a sin. They just think, oh, adultery is fine. God wouldn't be mad at me for that. They love a Jesus that's okay uh, with, with living with someone that you're not married to. Well, you know, we love each other, so it's fine. You know, I mean, the Jesus that I believe in is okay with that. We've all heard that, that those type of statements. Or they love a Jesus that's okay with, with just a few beers, right? We've all heard, well, I, I, yeah, I th my, my Jesus would drink a beer with me because people, people are inventing their own Jesus in their mind. They love a Jesus that's okay with rock and roll. So they think, you know what? Yeah, Jesus is fine with rock and roll. I mean, if we play rock and roll in the church, that's going to bring in more unsaved people. Isn't that, isn't that going to be great? You know, but what you win them with is what you keep them with, right? So if you're going to win people to your church with a bunch of rock and, ro a rock and roll beer church, then what you're going to keep them with is your rock and roll beer church. And last time I checked, Rock and roll and beer is, is not compatible with righteous living from the Bible. Amen. So they, or they love a long haired hippie Jesus. That's all right with all, all their sins that, that, you know, that, that, that wicked rock, rock and roll song that, you know, that says uh, G Jesus is all just all right. Right. Well, that that's Jesus ain't just all right with all, all your sin. Okay. The Jesus of the Bible has something to say about your sin. And people think that the Jesus of the Bible calling out your sin, they think that's not loving because they have a false sense of love. Because when the Jesus of the Bible that calls out your sin, why does he do that? Because he wants you to live a right life because he wants you to be blessed, right? So people love their sin so much that they literally think when you, when you start calling out their sin or taking it away, they think that's unloving. They think that's hateful. But actually, your, your sin is offensive to God and your sin's hateful to yourself because you're damaging yourself, you're destroying yourself. You're a servant of sin. So when the, when the real Jesus says not to commit adultery, they say, well, that's, that's not the Jesus that I believe in, right? Because they love, uh, they love another. They don't really know how to. They think they love Jesus. They don't love Jesus. They love a fraud. When you say Jesus doesn't love your sin, they say, well, I don't love your Jesus. I love my Jesus because my, my Jesus is okay with, with my sin, right? My Jesus is more loving than your Jesus. That's what they say. Well, your Jesus is a lie. Right? So you don't have the real Jesus. You have a fake Jesus that looks like you. So whatever sins you're into, Jesus is okay with it. Whatever sins you're not into, Je your Jesus is not okay with that. You know, well, you know, it's okay if I drink and it's okay if I drink, you know, I, I have a few beers. I, I listen to rock and roll. Um, oh, but killing someone. Yeah, you're going to go to hell for that. I mean, that is just so terrible, right? That's not consistent with, with what the Bible teaches. So you have not sought the, the reason why someone why do they have another jesus because they've not sought god by faith they've created an, an idol according to their own understanding people create their own jesus that makes them feel comfortable with their sin because they want to feel comfortable with their sin and they create a jesus that's going to help them to blend in with society so whatever society thinks is kind of normal and, and allowed that's the jesus that people come up with in their mind you know, so if we, if we were living in a society where it's independent fundamental Baptist, King James Bible, you know, old-fashioned hymns, soul winning, you know, teetotalism, tea which is like, you know, you don't drink any alcohol. If we lived in a society like that, then people, they probably, it would, it would be weird to come up with a Jesus that, that is okay with all your sin if you lived in a society that's not okay with that. But as soon as you're, you live in a society that's okay with abortion and, and homos, and adultery and pornography and all and and all this wicked stuff then it's like well yeah i've got a jesus that's kind of a, that, that he's okay with that you know i mean yeah somebody who gets an abortion i mean G jesus wouldn't be mad at them you know he, he would he would go with he'd go with them to the abortion it's just blasphemous that they would that they think oh jesus is going to go to the abortion clinic and and be there to support you right as you murder your baby right so they they believe in a fake jesus this is why so many people say they love jesus when they actually believe in another Jesus. They need to believe the real Jesus before it's too late. And that's why it's much more, impor more important to focus on the first group that we were talking about, which is saved Christians that are, have a misguided attempt at loving Jesus. Right? That's, that's the main one that I want to address. People that are unsaved or believing in a false Jesus, we know they need to get saved. We know they, that we need to preach them the gospel because they are deceived. Right? So you have saved Christians that think they know how to love Jesus, but in reality, they're, they're, they're kind of mis, misguided in their attempts. So 
Uh, let's start with uh, John 14, 15. You can turn there if you want. It's just that short verse. If ye love me, keep my commandments. So many of us are very familiar with this scripture, and we would use this we would use this verse as like the number one scripture on how to love Jesus. Hey, if you want to love Jesus, you know, just keep his commandments, you know, and that, that's certainly a good application. There, there is some truth to that. However, Jesus is not saying that the way you love him is by keeping his commandments. He's saying, if you love him, keep his commandments, right? Because there is a way to keep his commandments and not love him, isn't there, right? People do that every single day. There's unsaved religious people that they practice the Ten Commandments. They're reciting the Ten Commandments. They're, they're, they're doing their best to keep the law, right? They're, they're, they, there's also saved people that keep God's commandments, but they're doing it out of necessity and not necessarily for a love of Jesus. So, for example, it's possible to pray because you know you should, not because you want to, right? And so you wouldn't, if you're doing something because you know you should, and not because you want to, you wouldn't necessarily say like, I'm doing it because I love that person. No, you're doing it because you know you should. Just like, uh, there, there's plenty of examples of that. We'll, we'll get into that in a second. But, you know, like another example, it's possible to read your Bible because you know you should, not because you want to. Then not necessarily doing it out of love. You're doing it out of compulsion because God said I should. I, so I, he said I should read my Bible, so I'm going to read my Bible. And if I read my Bible, God's going to bless me for that. So I guess I'll do it because, you know, that's a good thing to do. But I don't really enjoy it. I don't really feel like it. But I'm going to do it anyway. Well, that's not really, you're not doing that out of love. Anybody, nobody would say all, the, all that, those things that you're feeling in your mind. is like, wow, he really loves doing that. Yeah, he's really having a great time. That's, he, he really genuinely just loves reading. That, that's not the attitude there, right? So, Keeping God's commandments out of compulsion to do so does not equate to love for God or loving Jesus. For example, I brush my teeth every single day because I know that I should, not because I love the activity of brushing and flossing my teeth, right? I'm, I do it every single day. I'm not really having that much fun while I'm doing it. It's rather boring, but I know it's good. That way, when you and I are having a conversation, you actually want to talk to me because my breath don't stink, right? So... I'm happy that I did it. I do it every day, but I didn't do it because I love it. I did it out of compulsion. I know it's a good thing to do. It's going to benefit me, right? My teeth aren't going to rot out of my head. If you love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, then emanating from you is the desire to keep God's commandments because you love him. You're keeping his commandments because you love him, not because you think that's what I got to do in order to love Jesus, right? For example, a wife could obey her husband without loving him. You know, a husband could ask his wife to cook dinner and she might do it because she knows she should, but she doesn't really want to do it, right? But a wife that obeys her husband because she loves her husband and she wants to provide a delicious meal for her family out of love, that's a completely different thing, right? So in both cases, dinner was cooked, but we all know that the dinner cooked with love that's the better meal, right? You can tell the difference. The meal that's cooked with love, the meal that's not cooked with love. The meal cooked with love is made at, is made at home by your mom or, or your wife that loves you. The meal that's not cooked with love is the one from the restaurant, which it's delicious, but you just there's no love in it because they're, they're just cooks in the back kitchen, right? So the way that you love God with all your heart, the way that you love anyone truly is to spend time with them and to know who they are by spending time with them and talking with them and doing things for them because you love them. Not just because it's all compulsion. Yeah, I, sh I know I, you know, my mom, I should be nice to her. You know, my dad, I should be nice to him. I should do what they say. You know, when they tell me to do stuff, I'm going to do it because, you know, the Bible says, you know, honor your father and mother. So, yeah, I should do that. It's a totally different thing than, wow, I love my mom. I love my dad. And when they tell me to do something, man, I'm going to do it for them because I just love them so much. Right? That's the type of attitude... Children, you should have that type of attitude toward your parents. You know, the wife should have that type of attitude toward her husband. The husband should have that type of attitude to, to his wife. And we should have that type of attitude toward God where we love God so much that we just, we can't help but want to do stuff for him. You know, obviously there's that aspect of the flesh there. And that's the part where we need to deny ourselves. You know, 
We need to have God increase and have ourselves decrease and realize that it's more important that we love God instead of just loving our own pleasures and, and loving everything that we want to do. So serving God and keeping his commandments should come as a natural extension of the love that we have for him. So you might be thinking to yourself, you know, I'm keeping God's commandments, but I'm just doing it because I know I should. I know it's good for me. I know that God wants me to do it, but I'm just not that into it. So turn to, to Psalm 51. Turn in your Bible to Psalm number 51. And we're going to read verses, uh, we're going to start at, at verse number 7. So Psalm 51 and verse number 7. The Bible reads, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. So if there's any problem that you're having in the Christian life, the first thing that we should do is talk to God. You might think, well, you know, I, I already pray, but I just do it because I know that I should, right? Maybe when you pray in your prayer, uh, this, is a, this is a thing, do you pray in a prayer closet, right? Now, a prayer closet is not this special room that is only a closet for prayer. You could take any r private room in your house, literally anywhere where it's quiet, where you can be left alone, and that, that's your prayer closet. Right? You don't have to have this little tiny closet. In the, this is my prayer closet, this is, and it can only be used as my prayer closet. It can be anywhere in your house. But it, it should also be at a time when you can be left alone where nobody's bothering you. Now, here's the thing. In my house, unless it's early in the morning, I'm probably going to be bothered by something, right? Because I've got two little babies, and if, if they know that I'm home and they can't see me, they're going to look for me, they're going to try to find me, maybe they're going to cry because they don't know where I'm at, right? So the best time to pray is early in the morning before the kids wake up, before all, you know, everybody's starting their car and honking their horn and, and swerving all over the place. That is the time when you want to get in your prayer closet and pray to God. So a lot of times, you know, if we just, if we just in the middle of the day, it's like, you know what, man, I've got to do stuff, I'm busy, I can't really sit down for even 15 minutes and pray to God. So you know what, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to pray to God, which obviously we should pray without ceasing. But there's something to be said about that special time that you spend with God alone, quiet, you know, early in the morning where nobody can bother you and you just talk to God. So again, if there's any problem that you're having in the Christian life, the first thing to do is, is talk to God. So, you know, maybe when you, when you pray, you said what you needed to say or what you think you should say, and then you said, in Jesus' name I pray, amen, right? And I'm not saying that he didn't hear you, but you didn't really talk to God, right? It's not that you didn't really talk to him, it's not that he didn't really hear you, but you weren't really there to sacrifice any of your time, you weren't there to listen, you were just there to just say what you needed to say, and then boom, done, right? God is not your magic genie that you call on when you need something, right? That's not the, just the purpose of, of praying to God is, well, I know that I should pray and I should say things that I want because if I ask, God's going to give them to me. So bing, bang, boom, you know, hak, hakala, bing, bang, a amen, right? That's not what the, your prayer is supposed to be. Prayer is supposed to be you talking to God. God is the creator of the universe and he loves you and he wants to talk to you and he wants you to listen, right? Amen? He's not there just to listen to you. You should also be there to listen to him. If I walked up to Brother Fabian, I said, Brother Fabian, there's some things that I want. So I'm just going to, you know, I want, I want, uh, I'm going to want lunch 
and I also am my, my have some damage in my car. I'm going to need that fixed, and I I need to be more blessed financially, and uh and and I need you to help me with this thing and that thing. Okay, thanks. Bye. Did we have a conversation? We did not. There was no exchange of anything. We did not have a conversation. How does Fabian feel if I just walk? Hey, this is all things I want. Okay, bye. I'm done. That's not simply what our prayer should be to God. You know, if I walked up to you and I told you all those, all the things that I want and need, and I said, okay, bye, you might actually be a little bit of, of offended. Be, uh, you could actually be a little bit offended by that, but you certainly wouldn't say that we had a conversation. Fabian would not say that we just had a conversation. We would say that I barked some stuff at him, and then it was done. So if you read verse number 17, it says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. So a contrite heart, it means that you're deeply affected with grief and sorrow for having offended God. That's what it means to be contrite. After everything that God has done for you, and you are struggling to serve God out of love, you're serving God out of compulsion, you're trying to love Jesus out of compulsion, you have offended God. You have offended God today. And you need to go in your prayer closet with a contrite spirit and say, God, I've offended you. I love you, God. Help me to love you more. Amen? Amen. You ought to make a sacrifice to God and get on your face in your prayer closet and say, I'm sorry, God. I love you, God. Please forgive me for offending you. Amen? Amen. Verse number 12. Or I'm sorry, verse, verse number 7. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. This is something that, this is a prayer that we can pray. If you're not sure what to pray, you can go to the book of Psalms. There's a whole bunch of prayers that, in my opinion, are some great prayers that made it into the Bible. And we can use that as an example of what to pray, pray to God. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. When's the last time you asked God? God, renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart. That is the, the prayer if we're struggling to love God, we're loving God out of compulsion, that is a, a prayer that we need to pray. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. We all know whenever you got saved, there was a time of, of extreme excitement and joy. And you need to, sometimes you need to sit down and pray and you need to remember that time when you were just, if you're struggling with loving God, you need to remember that time when you got saved, how thankful you were, how excited you were, how, how thankful you were that you had a good church to go to with, with, with good preaching from the Bible. And you need to lay down your face before God and say, God, re restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Amen. In verse number 13, it says, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. How to love Jesus. Sacrifice to Jesus. Can you get on your face for one hour and talk to God and listen to God? You know, when you read your Bible, are you reading a book or are you listening to God? That's another good question. When you look at your brother in Christ or your sister in Christ, are you trying to love them as you love yourself? On these two things hang all the law and uh, hang all the law and the prophets. Turn to, to John 21. John chapter number 21. We're going to read verse number 15. <clears throat> John 21 and verse number 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? 
He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because, unto him, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. So if you love Jesus, then feed his sheep. Who are Jesus' sheep? His sheep are your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, so as Christians, you know, we should read our Bible. We should pray. We should go soul winning. You know, we need to cleanse our heart. We should love righteousness. We should hate evil. We need to love God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind. But remember, go to, go to, go to 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter number four, we're going to read verse number 20. The Bible says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth love his brother also. So you have not seen God. But you have seen your brother. I mean, we could, if you look left and right, you've seen your brother and you've seen your, Chris, your, your sister in Christ. So if you're struggling to love God, if you have this misguided attempt at loving Jesus where you're saying, well, you know, it, the verse, if you love me, keep my commandments. So, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I don't really want to, but I know I should. So I'm keeping God's commandments and that means I love Jesus. If that's what you're trying to do in your Christian life, then maybe one thing that's going to help you is that you look at your brother and sister in Christ who you have seen and you love them as yourself and you love them like Jesus. Maybe that's what's going to bring the joy of your salvation back. That's what's going to bring the, the, the love in your life for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what, what's going to, to help you to love God more. Because again, if a man says, I love God and he hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom you have not seen. If you can't look at your brother and sister in Christ and love them and love them as yourself and love them as Jesus, then how can you truly say, well, I, I love God? You know, because the Bible is saying that you don't love God. If you can't even love your brother and sister in Christ, you should treat them like Jesus. You should care about them like you care about Jesus. That is how to love Jesus, right? Again, when we, when we read that, that first passage, Turn back, turn back to, uh, keep your finger in 1 John, but turn back to uh, Matthew chapter number 22. So in Matthew, in Matthew, uh, in Matthew 22, we were, we were reading at uh, verse uh, 38. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like, I'm sorry, we we're reading verse number 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So this person, they asked the question, Hey, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? When Jesus said, Hey, this is the great commandment in the law, he answered the question. That's all he had to say to answer the question. But he, on purpose, for a reason, says and he also gives you what the what the second commandment is because the second one is like unto it love your neighbor as yourself what that tells me is that these are two commandments that go one in another and if you want to love god deeply with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind what that tells me is that what one thing you're really going to need to focus on is loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, when your brothers and sisters in Christ, when they say, hey, I, I, you know what, I need your help with something, it's an emergency, you know, you ask yourself, well, man, if Jesus was in an emergency, would I help him? Or would I go, yeah, well, I'm kind of busy right now, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't help you, but, uh, you know, yeah, sorry, call, call somebody else. You know, e even if you literally couldn't do it in that moment, you might say, you know what, I'm so sorry, I can't help you right now, but I want, I'm going to call around and see who else can help you because I'm just way too far away. I wouldn't be able to help you in any reasonable period of time. You know, there's, there's, you literally ask yourself the next time that your brother or sister in Christ 
needs help with something, you know, do you feel like, well, man, they're, they're just asking me for help because, um, because we go to church together and they're just taking advantage of me. Well, here's the thing. It, it, as, as much as you did it under them, you did it under Christ. You know, so if, if someone's just ripping you off for some reason, you know, they're, they're just trying to waste your time, they're trying to take advantage of you, well, guess what? You did that under Jesus Christ, and God is going to reward you for that. So we don't want to have this attitude, well, I don't want to help him because he's just taking advantage of me because we're, we're fellow church members, and, you know, well, I know he did that one thing that one time, so, yeah, I'm not really going to help him at all. You know, he, here's the thing. It's going to be hard. Sometimes, I'm not saying this is easy. Sometimes it's going to be hard to, to love your brother and sister in Christ like you love Jesus because it's, you know, it's a little easier to love Jesus than, than some of us in here, right? Because we're sinners. We're not perfect. We say dumb things. We do stupid things. We make mistakes. Sometimes we offend each other and we don't mean to offend each other, you know, but God, here's the thing. He's without sin, right? So, and he saved you. He loves you. It, it could be a little bit easier to love Jesus than maybe it is to love one another. But here's the thing. If we look at one another like we would love Jesus, that's what's going to make it a little bit easier, right? So turn to, to 1 John chapter number, f uh, where, where, if you kept your finger there, 1 John 5, we're going to read verses 1 through 3. It says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat Loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we are the children. I'm sorry. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So you have this kind of back and forth of, hey, in order to love God, you know, hey, if you can't love your brother, you don't really love God. Hey, if you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, then, you know, like unto that is loving your neighbor as yourself. There's kind of this, if you love me, keep my commandments. There's this back and forth of loving God and keeping his commandments and keeping his commandments and loving God. And hey, this is how we know that we love the children of God when we love God and we keep his commandments. So these are, these are hand in hand. We can't simply just isolate loving God from loving our neighbor, loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. These two, what the Bible's teaching is that they're one in the same. So how to love Jesus? You know, pray and talk to God, listen to God. When you read the Bible, don't read a book. Read, a Bible, read the Bible like you're listening to God. Pray like you're waiting for God to say something to you. I'm not saying that God is going to speak to you in an audible voice, but what I am saying is that if you're reading the Bible and trying to listen to God, God's probably going to say something to, from you, to you out, out of the Bible. And when you're sitting in your prayer closet and you're praying to God and you've done your Bible re reading and you're, and you're reading your Bible like you're listening to God, there might be a verse that comes to you while you're praying and, and that is literally the applicable verse for the situation. That's how God speaks to, to us today is from his word. Listen to God. Don't just bark orders at God. You know, and, and here's the other thing. Go, go soul winning, right? You know, the joy of your salvation what were you happy about? What is, what is it that caused you to be so happy? You were so thankful that you got saved and you can't help but have the joy of your salvation restored unto you when you see the joy in someone else that gets saved. Amen. Amen. So that's, that's, that is uh, the, the last passage that I want to look at is, is uh, just First John uh, and th that last verse, number three. This is the love of God that we keep his commandment. Or I, I read the wrong one. Verse I wanted to read that one too, so let me, let me read uh, verse 2 again. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Let us pray.